Today is an amazing Sunday, just as Emma and Sandy said, and um, it's my privilege this morning to be here to share with you again. Um, I'll also say a very happy new year to you. I, I know it's a little bit late, it's like the 17th, but uh, a very happy new year to you because I haven't, I haven't seen you, and, and well, some of you I don't know, of course, and happy new year to you anyway, but uh, happy new year to those who I haven't seen in a while, and um, it is a great year. I, you know, I, I felt that just as I was walking in and listening, you know, hearing them say, it's a great year, and of course we make that faith declaration, but I believe it. I believe it. Do you believe it? It is a great year. I'm setting my faith uh, as a precedent at the very beginning saying, yes, no matter what happens, I've already decided it's a great year because my great year is not defined by my circumstance. My great year is defined by my faith confession and my wonderful and awesome God. Amen. It's funny how sometimes God will um, say something that through your own lips that surprises even yourself sometimes. Has that ever happened to you before? You find yourself in a, in a situation where you're saying something or maybe you look back later and you're like, wow, God actually said something pretty cool through my, my own mouth. Um, so as I was pre preparing for today, that kind of happened to me as I was um, thumbing through uh, the uh, previous messages that I've maybe taught from here or an LCSM, just trying to kind of get a gauge of my, you know, my own past messages and um, came across... Uh, one of my messages from December 29th, 2019, entitled, When Worry Becomes My Worship. Anybody other than my wife remember that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, someone said yes? yes? God bless her life. All right. I know all of you remember that because surely it's in your favorites by now. I'm sure you have it marked right on YouTube, so you'll completely remember, I'm sure. But in case you haven't, side note, if you're dealing with worry, anxiety, or depression... When you're watching this morning, worry, anxiety, or depression, I would say after this message, because you have to watch the whole thing, perhaps go on to the Light City YouTube and search When Worry Becomes My Worship from 2019, and there's a word there too. So I'm about to do um, perhaps what's called, uh, I'm about to be a John. And um, if you were with us last week, you'll remember Pastor Alex preached about what it is to be a John. It's kind of like the cr Christian equivalent of being a Karen. Uh, but I'm about to quote something that I said, okay, <laughs> to, 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 to give a point. And so I'm being a bit of a John, please forgive me. But on, this is what I, I made this statement in this, this video while I was watching it, and I was really surprised. This is what I said, uh, December, uh, now, now you have to remember, we're going into 2020, so I have no idea about 2020 yet, but this is something God put in my spirit. I said, my instruction from the Lord has been to sharpen our swords, in preparation for 2020. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Right? We know that scripture. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's time to go on the offensive, to sever the cord of the enemy and stop being, uh, and stop being the punching bag of the devil when God has given us the tools that we need to win in this world through Jesus Christ. It's time for us to leave old mindsets, the old ways of doing things behind. Anxiety, heaviness, depression, disappointment, sorrow, loneliness, unworthiness, anger, hatred, humiliation, heartbrokenness, and every other weight and lie behind and embrace the truth that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So that's a little snippet. But notice at the beginning I said, my instruction, and it, and it was, that's the word that God gave me at the time, was to sharpen our swords. And at the time, I thought, yeah, that's cool, iron sharpens iron, you know. But then looking back on it, I'm realizing that when God tells you to sharpen your sword, it means that you are about to enter a battle. When God tells you to sharpen your sword, he's telling you to prepare for war. And of course, I don't have to really further explain uh, given that we just went through 2020, that it was indeed and in fact the time to sharpen our swords for what we would face. And so I, I was looking back and I said, you know, wow, wow. So today we are, of course, as you've heard through the video and, and before this, that we are in the middle of the um, Never Too Late series. And today my topic is, it is never too late for our nation. 
It is never too late for our nation, and I'm very excited about this, especially in light of what is happening right now. There's a lot to say about our nation and nations, and for, just to clarify, um, I'm going to be really talking about the United States and Canada. We're in Canada, of course, but we're, you know, we're so tied to the United States, and so much of our family is American as well, our church family as well, and so when you hear me talk about the, it's never too late for our nation, we're really talking about North America. And of course, this applies to the whole world, but North America is local to us. And so when you hear nation, I'm talking about uh, Canada and the United States. Now, it is no surprise that we are living in a time of uncertainty. There are things happening right now that in our lifetime have never happened before. There are things that we are seeing that we've, we've never dealt with before. And there's a lot going on. Elections and re-elections and all sorts of, of, of just craziness happening in the world. It's a great time of uncertainty. And now times of uncertainty, you'll notice, are typically uh, the times that we experience the most fear in society. And the reason that society ex experiences the most fear is because simply we've never gone through something like that before. And you don't really have a measuring stick. When you're going through something new, oftentimes you don't know how to respond because you've never dealt with it. And um, thinking about my own life, um, you know, I remember when I first became a father, I found that a great time of uncertainty. Uh, in fact, forget even being a father, uh, going through the experience of, of, of watching your w wife become pregnant and give birth is a great time of, of uncertainty. And I, I can already feel a lot of the moms who've given birth go, yeah, you don't, you don't know. But I'm just going to give you a little bit from my perspective because that's all that I have, okay? So, you know, I found that to be a great time of uncertainty in my life. Of course, we could talk about um, um, the, the actual children, but I mean, even back to the very beginning, you know, yes, we found out that Kylie was pregnant and it's great. And then all these things started to happen where I realized I legitimately have zero experience in any of this before. I started reading blogs and listening to her talk, and I found out about these weird things like hospital bags. And if you know, you know. And if you don't, well, let me inform you. The hospital bag is that bag that you um, put in the back of your car, or in our case, our Jeep, in the event, once you start getting closer to the due date, that you have to quickly get to the hospital and don't have time to actually gather all the things that you need. So you pack reasonably what is called the hospital bag. And so there's not really a standard operating procedure for the hospital bag. And so, you know, we didn't really know what to put in it. And I was basically in charge of this thing. And so I tried to put in it everything that I could possibly imagine. And it, en it ended up being huge and trying to lug this thing into the hospital. Well, after going through uh, two of these times now with our wonderful children, uh, looking back, I now realize that basically the hospital bag needs to be 50% junk food and candy and 50% of things to keep you entertained because the hospital is boring, especially when you're there much longer than you anticipate. And with both of our kids, we were. And now I realize, see, so I'm giving you some advice if you've never went through it, 50% junk food and 50% entertainment and all the other things that you think you need, forget it, okay? So there was the hospital bag. There were other things like, you know, the speed limit. Let's just say hypothetically I was thinking, hey, what if I have to get to the hospital really fast and we're somewhere far away and I may need to speed to get there. So, you know, what is hypothetically, uh, you know, the maximum speed limit for a really big ticket as opposed to going to jail? You know, there were a lot of hypotheticals. There was, uh, you know, uncertainty and things that I had to learn. Now, of course, I knew how to tie my own shoes, but I never really tied the shoes of another person before, continually, not thinking about eventually, once your belly starts to get to a certain point, you can't really reach down and tie your shoes. And so I became a master at tying my wife's shoes. I became a master shopper at weird times of the night as I went out to buy black olives and ice cream specifically. And God help you if you came back with green olives instead of black olives. So I became a master shopper in these moments of, of uncertainty. Now, some of these are just, you know, maybe a, a, a funny story. But we're living in a moment in history right now that is unfamiliar to all of us with a lot of unknowns. And it's being said that we're more divided right now as human beings than we have ever been in human history. If you watch the news, you've heard that being repeated over and over and over again, and it's really become to, uh, uh, almost accepted as fact 
But I would actually submit this morning that that is not the case. You see, when we hear things that make us feel like we've never experienced something before, we have a tendency to kind of freak out about it. This, this world has never been this divided before, so I'm not exactly sure what to do. It, it paralyzes you. But I'd like to, to argue, if I could this morning, that that is not the case and that there is not the need for fear and irrational thinking and panicking. The world has been through many pandemics before. The world has been through many epidemics before. This is not the first time humanity has gone through a pandemic. History shows the entire existence of man is littered with seasons of great infighting and division. Here's the truth, right? And the Bible says the truth shall make you free. It shall set you free, right? Here's the truth. God has not disappeared. Jesus is still on the throne. Your faith is not broken. It is alive and it is working. But the story feels different when you're the main character. The difference is the story feels different when you're the main character. It's one thing to read about something, and it's another thing to experience it firsthand, just as I was becoming a father. Even in the Bible, it's one thing to, you, I think about these scriptures, we hear about wars and pestilences, right? And you, you hear of a pestilence and disease, and it says, oh yeah, and 100,000 people died. And, and in one page turn, you're like, whoa, that's crazy. But it's different when it's happening in your own neighborhood. That's the difference. And in these moments of uncertainty where we feel that it's different because we're experiencing them, these are the very moments where we allow faith to take the reins, so to speak. We remind ourselves that God has not given us the spirit of fear, right? Scripture says, if you're afraid, that's not God. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you find yourself confused, you declare out of your own mouth, I have a sound mind. I have a sound mind. I say that all the time. Even if you're not confused, say it right now. Say, I have a sound mind. And if you're rebellious and you're still not saying it, I'll give you one more chance online. Say, I have, oh, I heard it this time, a sound mind. Amen. I have a sound mind. The wonderful thing about the word of God is that it's still true and it still works and it's still working even when it feels otherwise because our faith is not determined by how we feel about it. Our faith is based on the truth of God's word, which continues to go out of our mouth, right? And it's not out of God's mouth, out of our mouth, and it's not going to return to him void. Once you release it, it is out there and working. The fact that you just said, I have a sound mind in faith right now has released something into your atmosphere that you are going to harvest. A sound mind. Now, we have to realize that the plan of Satan, right, through time, um, at its most basic form, has always been about division. You've heard the phrase divide and conquer. That did not originate with the Romans. That is the devil. The devil has always been about divide and conquer, deceive and destroy, right? The Bible says he comes not but to steal, to kill, destroy. That has been the, 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 the devil's plan at its most rudimentary form. Now, we understand that while division may, if you were to say, look into Wikipedia, what is the definition of division? It might say to separate into parts. But spiritually speaking, a more accurate uh, definition of division, which you've probably heard, is to have two visions. Division is to have two visions. And we know that scripture says, a house divided against itself cannot stand, right? More, more specifically, Matthew uh, 12, 25, Jesus says, every kingdom divided against itself, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So this is talking about everything from a business to a family to a government to a kingdom to whatever. If there is two visions, it is only a matter of time between there is infighting and Jesus says that that cannot stand. But just to kind of further prove my point that this is not the greatest moment of division we've ever seen, I'd like to read you uh, an excerpt 
from a speech that was given by a man that you may perhaps know. His name is Abraham Lincoln. And um, now you have to forgive me because Mr. Lincoln has a way with words. He was a lawyer, and he's very poetic. So as I read this to you, your mind is going to be perhaps trying to grasp what he's even saying, but I promise you by the end it becomes clear. So let me just read you a little bit. I'll fill you in. Abraham Lincoln, okay, this is uh, the moment of time. He is at the Illinois Republican State Convention in Springfield, Illinois on June 16, 1858. At this point, he is not yet president. He has been uh, nominated to the Republican ticket in a very unconventional way. This is about two weeks before I believe that happened or two weeks afterwards, right around there. And he, so he's at the, uh, the Republican convention in Illinois, and really this, this speech is directed at Senator Stephen A. Douglas. And if, if you love history, you, you should look into this because it's, it, I find it quite fascinating. But this is what Abraham Lincoln had to say. Mr. President and gentlemen of the convention, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. We are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In other words, constantly changed. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. And here he quotes scripture. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place where public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Talk about division. So division and uncertainty, they're, they're not something new, but it just feels different when you're the main character. Say this, say, my feelings, my feelings do not determine, not determine. my faith. faith. No. The world wants you to believe that, but it's not true. Your feelings do not determine your faith. I'd like to remind you this morning, or this afternoon or evening, if you're watching this at a later time, that there is a spirit driving every atmosphere. There's a spirit behind every atmosphere. And all natural fruit is bound to a spiritual root. Everything, all the natural things we see are bound to a spiritual root. And lasting change, of course, it does manifest, right, in the, in the natural realm, in the natural world, but the foundational work that sustains it can only be initiated in the spirit. The Bible tells us plainly, you know, we're not fighting against flesh or blood. You know the scripture, we're fighting against principalities and powers. We're fighting against spiritual forces. We're fighting against demonic forces, demonic pressure. But humanity has become so consumed with fighting each other, with fighting people. But our problem isn't people. Our problem isn't a political party. If you're Canadian, liberal, or conservative, if you're American, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green Party. <laughs> Your problem isn't a political party. And I, and I, and I know, and, this, and this, may, this may upset you, even your problem is not an ideology. The problem is there is a spirit that is loosed by deception, sin, unbelief, and wickedness and is only bound by the exercise of truth, love, faith, prayer, and righteousness. It is a spirit that is loosed 
by deception and wickedness and sin and is bound by truth and faith and love and prayer and righteousness. Our weapon, our battle rather, is not against people. Our problem is not people. It is a spirit. There's a prophet in the Bible who believed, like many of us do today, that the problem was people. There was a, a prophet named Jonah. Doesn't have such a good rap. Now, Jonah was sent, if you remember the story, Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh. And Nineveh was a beautiful city at the time. It was, um, it was kind of the jewel of, of the region. And it had um, these sprawling giant walls that guarded the whole city. And it had an aqueduct at the time, which was an amazing thing. So there would be water and, you know, within the city. And um, it was a hub for trade. And there were a lot of amazing things that were happening in Nineveh at the time. So Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh, and Nineveh was ruled by King Sennacherib. Sennacherib, there's a fun word. So King Sennacherib uh, uh, of the Assyrian, so it was the Assyrian Empire, and it was located in what we know today as modern-day Iraq, specifically Mosul. So if you go to Mosul, you're basically in Nineveh. So God charges Jonah to go to Nineveh and cry out against, uh, against it because of their great wickedness, the Bible says. But Jonah refuses to head to Tarshish because the Ninevites were the enemies of Israel. And in case you're wondering, I did pronounce Tarshish correctly. It's one of those funny Bible words that doesn't sound right when you say it, Tarshish. It sounds like uh, if you went to a fine dining restaurant, I would say, I'd like the, the filet mignon with the Caesar salad and a side of Tarshish, perhaps. You know, it's one of those funny, weird words. But it's Tarshish. Even just saying it now, it feels weird. He went, to, he went to Tarshish because he was running away from God. C can you believe the audacity of Jonah to run away from God? Imagine God telling you to do something and you do the opposite. The Bible is so unrelatable and sometimes it's just completely dated. I can't imagine a time in life where God would tell you to do something and you wouldn't do it. But for the sake of education, let's continue to read about Jonah. <laughs> So Jonah runs away from God, and he ends up on this ship, if you remember, right? And he's, he's, trying, to, he's trying to get away, and a great storm comes upon the water, and, and Jonah is now sleeping in, underneath the boat, and, um, and, and the men are freaking out, trying to figure out why there's this huge storm. So they wake Jonah up, and they say, hey, hey, hey Jonah, uh, you know, is there anything that you could tell us that may indicate why there's a crazy storm? And he basically says, and I am paraphrasing, this is not the translation, he, he is saying, hey, guys, guess what? God's after me because I won't go do the thing he wants to do. And basically, the way to solve this is throw me overboard because if you don't, you're going to die. And they're like, that sounds crazy. We're going to try to do everything else first. They do that. It doesn't work. And they're like, yeah, he's right. This is the last thing to do. So we're going to throw him overboard or we're going to die. And they do it. And the storm stops. And it says they make vows and shred their clothes. And, you know. And so Jonah now, as the story continues, he, he ends up getting swallowed by this giant fish, a.k.a. a whale. Now, I do have to interject and say this is not the story of Pinocchio. Sometimes we get this crazy, uh, we get this imagery confused, confused where you have Pinocchio, Geppetto, right? Geppetto goes into the whale, and he's in his house, and Pinocchio comes and saves him, and they start a fire and get out. Jonah died. Sometimes we don't get that, okay? You remember Jesus refers to, just like Jonah was in the belly of the whale in three days, that, that whole thing? Read the story carefully. Jonah actually dies. Now, while he's in there, he's praying, and then it talks about him praying from Sheol, or basically Abraham's bosom. God resurrects him, okay? God resurrects him, and that's when he goes to, back to Nineveh. So Jonah goes back to Nineveh. He cries out against the city just like God wanted in the first place. And the entire city, including the king, ends up repenting. And God actually spares the city. So then Jonah gets bitter. And he throws a pity party and he tells God, it's better for me to die than to see the Ninevites free. Now here's some takeaways from the story of Jonah. Firstly, God always prefers mercy over judgment. God wants to save our nations. God wants to deliver us. This isn't something we are having to argue for. He prefers it that way. Judgment is the last resort for God. And so sometimes just believing that and shifting our mindset that, you know, we're not just waiting back for God to judge us, but no, but God wants to 
deliver us. God always prefers mercy over judgment. Psalm 145, 8 through 9 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies over all his works. It's never too late for a people. It's never too late for a nation. Takeaway number two, affliction can cause clarity. Ugh. Affliction can cause clarity. If God can't get your attention with Scripture, he may just send a storm. And I know that messes with some of your theology. I know it. God may send a storm. Read the, I'm sorry, read the Scripture. This is what it says. I quote, God sent out a great wind. God made the storm. Now, God had a plan for the storm. He had a plan of redemption but he couldn't get Jonah's attention any other way. So God created the storm. If God can't get our attention one way, he will get it another way. I recommend the first way, because it's usually the less painful way. Lord, get my attention with Scripture. So, talking about, because ultimately our objective, we want healing in our land, right? That's what we want. We want healing in our land. We know that the plan of division is not of God. We want restoration. So what's our role in bringing healing to our nation as individuals and as a people? The Bible tells us plainly, and, and the scripture reference is already in the video, Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We have to remember that this scripture that I just read is a conditional scripture. It's a promise from God that requires our participation to see it to come to pass. Our involvement is critical. Satan is defeated, but he will not relent until he is completely removed. Sometimes we forget that. Yeah, Jesus defeated Satan. Woo, party time. No, not party time. You see, he has been defeated, but he's still here with people who will bow to his will by being in agreement with his kingdom, which means, in effect, that he can still uh, uh, cause chaos. And you may hear, heard the quote, and I'm not exactly sure how it goes, but it basically says that evil will prevail when good men and women sit back and do nothing. Right? So he's defeated, but evil will not relent until completely removed. So let's break down that scripture into its steps. What is God saying? What is required from us? God speaking says, I will heal your land if you do these things. Number one, it says humble ourselves. So what does humble ourselves really mean? Hum a simple way to, to, to define humility or, or humbling yourself is to look inward before looking outward. You remember Jesus when he talked about the speck and the plank. Right? He says, first remove the speck or the dust or the moat, or there's lots of different things, in your own eye, then you will see clearly how to remove the plank in your brother's eye. So Jesus is saying, first turn inwards, then turn outwards. If you turn outwards before turning inwards, you judge. If you turn inwards first before turning outwards, you love. Right? That's why he said, turn inwards first, then turn outwards, because now your motivation is out of love rather, and mercy rather than judgment. We humble ourselves by spending time listens to, listening to other people, trying to see it from their perspective, even when we don't agree. Sometimes people are more willing to listen to us when we are simply more willing to listen to them. And even though we come with our rebuttal and we come with our scripture, which is great, and we come with everything that we know, which is great, Sometimes we simply need to allow the conversation to go on a little bit. We hear them out. Maybe we're going to see something in their story that we never saw before that is going to open up a brand new avenue of dialogue. We humble ourselves by asking for God's help. We don't always have to have every answer. And let me explain this because I don't want to be confusing. There is power in the I don't know. Now, I don't always know how, but I always know who. You understand what I'm saying? 
You see, sometimes we find ourselves in situations, especially these days, when people are going through tremendous suffering and pain. It is not ideal when someone is going through a tremendous amount of suffering to say, well, if you read your Bible more, I'm sure God would deliver you. That is not helpful, right? And sometimes you simply need to be in a situation with someone in love and say, you know what, honestly, I don't know why this happened. I don't know how it happened, but I do know who has the answer. And I'm just going to tell you about who. I'm not making judgments on what happened. I'm not trying to give you a 10-step program on how to make your life more awesome, even though I could. I'm just going to love you, and I'm just going to tell you about who. The power of I don't know. Number two, the Bible says pray. Pray what? Pray the will of God. What's the will of God? The will of God is the word of God. So if you don't know the will of God, you start opening up the Bible and God starts speaking to you about what to pray. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray for your government leaders. Pray for your prime minister. Pray for your president. Pray for your president-elect. Pray for your government leaders. I think many times we get in the situations that we're in today is because we're not praying for our leaders, to tell you the truth. Pray for the church. Pray for your church leaders. Pray for those who fight against you, and I hate that one, but the Bible says it, so i got to put it in there. Pray for your enemies, it says. Ah, really? Yeah, really? Because that's a strategy against the kingdom of darkness. Satan hates it when you pray for those who persecute you. He hates it because it undoes everything he's worked so hard to build. He can't stand it when you pray for your enemies. If you want to drive them crazy, pray for the people who are driving you crazy. The antidote to division in the spirit is prayer. Prayer is the fuel for change. We have a wood burner in our home, and we haven't been able to use it so much because it's, the temperature hasn't been so cold. Good for some, not good for me when I am isolated and I want the fire. And, um, you know, but the fire requires fuel, right? Logs are the fuel that makes the fire burn. And when the fuel is gone, there goes the fire, right? Prayer is the fuel for change. If prayer runs out, the change goes away. Number three, he said, seek my face. Now, seek my face, it's an expression of relationship. Okay, you only see someone's face when you're in their presence. Well, unless you're on Zoom. But that makes my spiritual saying way less cool. So let's just forget about Zoom for a moment. And I'll say, seeking God's face means to know his heart. It means having his love for the lost. And it means refusing to become apathetic. Well, the world is burning down anyway, so I might as well just sit back and eat my popcorn and wait for Jesus to ride in on the white horse. Woo! No! No, Satan wants us to become apathetic. And to feel like, yeah, it's all burning down. We're so divided. Who cares? No, it's been divided since the beginning of time. And God is doing a work. And faith still works. And your faith isn't broken. And God's still on the throne. And everything that was happening before the pandemic is still happening. And the only thing that we have to do is not be deceived and jump into whatever the world has experienced. Because God has called us to be separate from the world. We do not have to experience what the world is experiencing. Don't allow yourself to be convinced that you need to jump in the boat that is sinking. Wow. Now, the, 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 the number four, our favorite, repent. The Bible says, he says, repent. Turn from our wicked ways. Turn from sin. Turn from the things that are trapping you. I know, easier said than done. This is what sin is. I, I feel like sometimes we make sin to be this like, quite complex thing. Sin is trying to fill a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. Okay? That's what sin is. You're trying to fill a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. If we want to change the fruit, we must begin at the root. Now, lasting change will never come by fighting symptoms. Okay? Lasting change will never come by fighting symptoms. Last year, um, I remember that, uh, uh, I remember, of course I remember because it was a kind of a traumatic thing. Uh, I had injured my shoulder at the beginning of 2020 
And um, I had found that, um, you know, something was, it was just like a daily thing and it was getting worse. And so I decided to go and to get these painkillers um, from the doctor uh, at, his, at his prescription. He said, you know, I think it's just you might have bruised it or injured it. So here, have these painkillers. And I'm like, okay, that's great. And I don't really like taking painkillers because painkillers um, tend to make my stomach feel kind of gnarly and weird. And, you know, I just, I really don't like it. And if I can get away from it, I don't like to take uh, the medication. So I started taking these painkillers, and then I found about in two months I'm into this thing, still taking the painkillers, because now I'm basically needing it to function. And I'm like, no, this is this, all I'm doing is masking the symptom here. I need, to, I need to dig deeper into this thing. And so what I started to do is I went out to a, a different doctor eventually, um, chiropractor, and basically learned that my rotator cuff, there was an issue with the rotator cuff. So we started to do therapy and treatment where um, I started to receive uh, uh, healing in that area from the treatment, and then I got off the painkillers. 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 You see, painkillers don't always come in the form of a pill. And a lot of us are dealing with painkillers in our own life. Maybe your painkiller isn't in the form of a prescription. Maybe your painkiller is in the form of pornography. Because of a deep wound from a long time ago, and you want to escape it, but it brings temporary relief, so you keep running back to the painkiller. Maybe the painkiller isn't pornography. Maybe it's the constant desire for the approval of other people. And your worth as a human being has now been tied to the compliments of people, and now you live and need the compliments of people, even for the smallest task. But the problem is, when you live for somebody's compliments, you can die by their criticism. And now you find yourself trapped in the cycle of this painkiller. Maybe your painkiller isn't the need for approval. Maybe your painkiller is a toxic relationship. Maybe a friendship or an intimate relationship. And you know you should sever it. But the problem is, in that moment of that toxic relationship, there's just something there that numbs you to the fact of having to go and actually deal with the root and it feels easier to just let the relationship continue when you know it needs to be cut off. Maybe your painkiller is in the toxic relationship. Maybe it's a relationship with trust. Maybe you've gone through life and it seems that every time you trust somebody, they let you down. Maybe the people in your, your life who you've trusted the most have let you down and it feels like how can I ever trust again I trust and I'm let down I trust and I'm let down I trust and I let down and you've decided in your heart I'm just done trusting I'm just done trusting but the problem with that is when you stop trusting you stop transforming maybe it's not trust Maybe it's bitterness, and you're advanced in years, and you lived a long time on this planet, and you've seen a lot of things, and you've dealt with a lot of people and a lot of circumstances, and you're just tired. You're just tired, and you've become bitter. And you're bitter because it's easier to be bitter than it is to be better. Painkillers. Painkillers. You see, the problem with painkillers is that painkillers become our prisons. Painkillers become our prisons. And the thing that you started to take to get freedom, now you need to function. Painkillers. You know, many people are stuck in their lifestyles not because they want to be there. Truthfully. We have this idea sometimes that people are, 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 you know, if you have sin in your life that's visible to the outside world, we oftentimes go, yeah, that person wants to be there because they're stuck in the sin. But the reality of it is they're stuck in a prison. Let me tell you something. When you go to prison, what happens first? Judgment. You go before a judge. You get judged. Then you go to prison. Why did Jesus say, do not judge? Because their prison is already judging them. See, we look on the outside and we begin to judge them. 
Jesus said, no, don't judge. You see, sin is already judgment. Judgment is already being carried out. The wages of sin is death. But so many times Christians get so confused in trying to solve the symptom from their own unhealed heart, we're judging the very people God's called us to love because it is the compassion and love and mercy of God that is going to release them from prison, not judgment, which they're already getting from the painkiller. Our flesh wants us to look outward, but the Spirit calls us to look inward. Can I say that national restoration begins with personal transformation? I just have a few more things before closing. We like to talk a lot about revival, but we talk a l very little about reformation. And reformation, what that is, is it's a return to the sound doctrine of the Bible. So revival is the practice of that sound doctrine under the power of the Holy Spirit. Reformation is a return to sound doctrine. What brings reformation is repentance. Remember, we're still on the fourth point here, in case you forgot. Repentance. Repentance, reformation, revival. Repentance, reformation, revival. The, the three R's, if you will. I want to quickly tell you about a man named Jonathan Goforth. Jonathan Goforth was a famous Canadian missionary and evangelist to China. He was born in 1859 and he grew up in Oxford County, Ontario. Oxford County is between London and Brantford, if you don't know, and uh, Woodstock is kind of right around that area. He was present when the Manchurian revival broke out in China, which, if you're not familiar with that, it was the first revival to gain na uh, nationwide publicity in China. And if you know anything about a communist country, revival eh, isn't exactly what they're looking for. So go forth, okay. He went on to become one of the most recognized and admired missionaries in China. And this is what he said about revival. If revival is being withheld from us, it is because some idol remains still enthroned. Because we still insist in placing our reliance in human schemes. Because we still refuse to face the unchangeable truth that it is not by might, but by His Spirit. In other words, Stop waiting for a vaccine to save the world. Stop waiting for another election to save the world. Because it's not by might. It's not by the schemes of man. It is by God's spirit. If we repent, we will reform, and we will have revival. I'm telling you about John and Goforth because we often see ourselves as so insignificant. But here's a man right from Ontario. Not just Ontario, just a couple hours down the road, who literally changed the nation because he simply God gave, uh, gave God his yes. Can I say to you that God will move in your life, but he needs your yes. I have one question for you, and I'm going to say it with a smile. What has God been asking you to do that you've been trying to ignore? What has God been asking you to do that you've been trying to ignore? Can I tell you that what your heart has been longing for is on the other side of your yes? The thing that you've been wanting is actually on the other side of your yes. The thing that God wants you to do that you're running from? And don't pretend like you don't know. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That thing right there, that thing that you try to hide away and not think about because you know if you think about it too long, God just may convince you to do it. The thing that you have been desiring is on the other side of your yes. Don't let the devil convince you out of your promise. So revival begins with us. Just two more, or a few more quick little things. Anne Graham Lott says, revival begins when you draw a circle around yourself and make sure everything in that circle is right with God. Revival isn't the discovery of a new truth. 
It's the rediscovery of the eternal truth that God's, of God's love, holiness, and power. We're just, we're just returning. Last thing I'll say. We're going to pray. Um, I wrote this song. If you didn't know I write songs, I write songs. Now you know. Uh, I wrote this song called Promised Land, and there's one line in it that says this. There's always hope for tomorrow when we make a way by working to save our today. There's always hope for tomorrow when we make a way by working to save our today. It is never too late for Canada or the United States. Father, this morning we come to you, Lord, and we, we, we are full of hope and full of faith, knowing that you are faithful and true, knowing that you are good, God, and that you desire more than we desire to heal our hearts and to heal our land. Father, we're calling on you this morning in sincerity. And we're asking, Father, we, we, we are telling you, Lord, that we are willing to do what you've asked us to do. We are willing, Father, to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek your face, and to turn from our wicked ways. We even now, Lord, just collectively together repent, Lord, for wherever we are missing it, God, for trying to fill legitimate needs in illegitimate ways. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us, God. Forgive us for running back to the painkillers. Forgive us for running back to the painkillers over and over again, God. Running back to the prison when you have so desired to set us free. Open our eyes, God. Open our eyes, Father. We repent, Lord, at any area of our life where we have made an idol, whether it be whatever it is. Trust in the ways of man. Maybe money. When we're pressured in a, in a season, God, where so many people find themselves in need, maybe money has become our idol. Whatever it is, Father, reveal it to us. We desire to see healing in our land, God, and we, we know that we need it, Lord, and here we are. We pray for our leaders. We pray for Justin Trudeau. We pray for Donald Trump. We pray for Joe Biden, and we're asking, Father, that your will be done, Lord, that you would lead whoever is in power that you would use them, Father, to accomplish your will, that we would have good leaders, Lord, and the land would prosper. Thank you, Jesus. And we just invite your presence and peace, Lord, to follow us every step, every day. This is a quick prayer, Father, but we believe it. We believe it. And we're releasing it to the atmosphere around the world right now. We will see revival. We will see restoration. And if I can just say one more thing. When we repent, this is, this is the power of repentance. The problem with being deceived is you don't know when you're deceived. When you repent, it's like the blinders on your eyes are taken off and you can see the truth that you couldn't see before. That's why repentance brings reformation. You see, the word is always there, but if you're deceived, you can't see it. So by you joining in this prayer this morning, God is going to remove any blinders off your eyes, and the truth is going to light up like a Christmas tree for you, and you're going to see it can I tell you? Go after that truth. Give God your yes. This is a great year for you. Amen.